Hi, I'm Dr. Jamil Sayaj. And on this podcast, we're going to talk about some deep stuff. I'm here to tell you that you're amazing. And often, the only person who can't see that is you. No matter who you are, what you do, or where you're from, there's greatness in you. Let's talk about it. Hey everyone, I'm Dr. Jamil Sayaj, life, business, and relationship coach, and welcome to the Transformation Starts Today podcast, where I interview leaders, champions, and high performers from all walks of life as they share their stories, the lessons they've learned along the way, and empowering perspectives to help you create an extraordinary life without regret. Today, we have the pleasure and privilege of being with one of my mentors, Dr. Barry Taylor. Dr. Barry Taylor is a naturopathic healer, and over many decades, he has helped thousands with his Love Your Body program, a well-balanced approach to healing and achieving vibrant health. His new book, Love Your Body, Your Path to Transformation, Health, and Healing, tells the story in depth. For those who are tired of merely treating symptoms or putting up with disease, Dr. Taylor offers healthy science-based alternatives to healing. I first met Dr. Taylor when I was in medical school in Arizona, and I had the opportunity to be a part of his year-long program about becoming a true healer. That year-long program has now flourished and developed into a beautiful friendship and brotherhood that I truly consider a blessing. Dr. Taylor, welcome to the show. Great to be with you. Really, really good to be with you. I, I would go a long way to cheer you on. <clears throat> Thank you so much. How are you doing today? I'm, I'm awesome. I'm awesome. I'm waiting for the music because in the intro, you said something about champion. So it triggered my pattern in my head. We are the champions. <laughs> and, and you might want to, you know, speak to your producer about, you know, when you say that line, kind of come in with that music. Well, you, you'll see when the episode's live, the intro music's pretty sick. <laughs> it has that vibe. <laughs> Uh, so I'd love to, I can't wait to, you know, share you with my community and to really dive in. And so for my listeners who don't know you, don't know your story, how do you come to be doing what you're doing now? Catch us up. How did I come to do what I'm doing? <clears throat> um, <clears throat> you mean shortly after my parents dropped me on my head and the follow up to that? Or A minute or two after that. Yeah. <laughs> Um, <clears throat> I was majoring in comparative religion as an undergraduate. I thought for sure uh, that going to divinity school to get a degree in comparative religion and following in the footsteps of John Kabat-Zinn and other people, um, John, Johnny uh, taught biology and when people taught his, took his biology class at Brandeis, they basically did yoga and meditation. And I thought that was a great gig, to tell you the truth. I, I thought <laughs> at the same time, I was introduced to a man named Dr. Louis Ballot, got his um, MD degree in 1930, his naturopathic degree in 1932. And my teachers at Brandeis, as I was doing this major in comparative religion, introduced me to him. So the short version is he became an extraordinary mentor. I saw him every Monday at nine o'clock for four years uh, to kind of develop self-care and, and, and really start to look at why I was getting sick as a kid so much with headaches and strep and, uh, and blink blink, uh, turned my um, car around and did not go to divinity school, um, but I went to naturopathic school. Mm. And um, that, that was a century ago. That was last century. <laughs> Something I want to point out that you shared that I think everyone in the audience can benefit from, including myself. Notice Dr. Taylor said every Monday for four years, I think you said 9 a.m., he okay. met with his mentor. So the word that comes to mind for me, you know, commitment. Yeah. And so whatever it is that you want to be good at, whatever it is you want to get better at, whatever you want to learn, what's your commitment? How committed to you are that? What's your practice? Yes. And notice with Dr. Taylor, he got immense value and life transformation from those four years, I'm sure. But he right. came from showing up 52 yeah. times a year, at yeah. least. <laughs> yeah. for, for three, four years in a row, uh, mm -hmm. he was really one of my heroes. Um, one of my uh, Love Your Body programs, which we might get into later, 
-hmm. is called the power of commitment and as a tool for healing. But what's the distinction between I want this? That's interesting. You know, I I, I do a lot of self-disclosure in my practice since (laughs) how did I somewhat begin to unscramble my brain? And I tell people, you know, if you ask me what I want, I would say, I want to be a race car driver. Do you like to drive cars fast? I, I mean, there's something <laughs> exhilarating. But when I look at my money, my time, the action in my life, there's no congruency between moving any more forward than 20, 30 years ago about being a race car driver. So commitment has something to do with looking at yourself beyond thoughts and feelings and living as a promiser and how to develop that as an identity. And I've been interviewed a number of times, but no one except for you, one of the many, many reasons I love you so much, uh, has ever translated my work with Dr. Balat in the beginning. I mean, I did it out of suffering and my body not doing well, having so many headaches and other kinds of symptoms that undermined what I thought I wanted to do. and um, like you do with your clients and I do with my clients, I, I, I want to make it humorous. I want to make it an adventure. I want to make it about possibilities, not like have tos and shoulds. You know, this is a partnership. And I was really graced by working with this extraordinarily brilliant naturopath, also MD, uh, who had been practicing for decades. Um, and um, yeah, thank you for acknowledging. It, it was a commitment that he made easier because every time I saw him, what you do with your clients, what I do with my clients is take them a little bit more, open the door a bit more, you know, not like we're holding back anytime we see somebody, but the idea that somebody is willing to be so willing to have us contribute to them. That's the way Dr. Balat was for me. So yeah, yeah. there you have it. And and, uh, yeah, something that came to mind when, so first of all, for everyone who's listening, I'm sure you can get a feel for the foundation (laughs) of so much of what both of us do is commitment. And something Dr. Taylor just reminded me of is a distinction I often share with my clients is the distinction between want to and choose to. And so like Dr. Taylor said, notice there are things in your life right now that you might say, I want this, I want this, I want this, but I could come back with, all right, how long have you wanted that for? And you might tell me days, months, years, decades. Well, have you chosen it? You know, what are you doing about it? And often there's not a choice. There's just a want to coupled with a story about why I can't or why I shouldn't or anything like that, right? Now, before we go too too deep into it, you mentioned several times and I mentioned it in your bio, you know, naturopathic medicine, being a naturopathic physician and healer Mm -hmm. yourself. For those who aren't clear on what that is, how would, you know, what is naturopathic medicine for you? What is that type of healing? Mm. Well, the qualifier there, um, Dr. Jamil, is for me. Uh, for you, cause, yes. Because my take on naturopathic medicine um, um, is some synergy of who I thought I was becoming, really loving transcendental Um, ecumenical, the way religions come together, the way religions are structures for people to find out about themselves spiritually. And while uh, I chose to not have to learn um, German to read literature, (laughs) so I didn't go to get my PhD in comparative religion, my take on naturopathic medicine is that for some people, it's about natural, natural therapeutics. Mm-hmm. And, 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 and then Jeff Bland, um, who, who I have an enormous amount of love for, wrote the foreword to my book, coined the term functional medicine. So on the one hand, there's a, a model about addressing causes physically and working with herbs and nutrition and food and vitamins and homeopathics um, that stimulate the body's own resources and not just treating the tip of the iceberg. And, and most naturopaths I know do that fair, really well, oh my God, brilliantly. Uh, my take on naturopathic medicine is it's a portal for me to be with people and open up possibilities for their life that they don't necessarily um, see. Um, so for some people, 
uh, their eczema, their migraines, their menopause, their fibroids, their endometriosis, their colitis, their allergies is physical. And then do we need to build their body up, strengthen their body, or are we going to rest, cleanse, detox? And sometimes a cigar is just a cigar. Um, here, take this zinc. I think it'll make a huge difference. Because of who I am, was, still love being, um, sometimes the body is a metaphor. It's kind of like poetry. And it's all about symbols. It's not like, oh, you may want to cut back your coffee, but it's also not about never drinking coffee. It's not about everyone should be a vegetarian or everyone should be paleo. But for me, <clears throat> being a naturopath gives me permission to ask people and for them to give me permission to be a partner with them to discover possibilities about their physical body, how they might relax. Um, the way I say it is, you know, how could we not just get rid of your symptom? How could we not just help you lose weight? But how could you feel more at home in your body? What would it be like if you felt more at home? So for some people, what's going on in your physical body is very physical. But for a lot of people, I've practiced, oh my God, close to 50 years, which is amazing because I'm only 42 years old. So I was practicing for <laughs> eight years in my mother's oven in the whoop. Um, so for some people, their body's symptom is all about some experiences that are not processed. And they're in a, in a pickle. They're a normal person doing their best to avoid getting angry or doing a best to try to get over their pressure and overwhelm and anxiety. So for me, being a naturopath sometimes is coaching people to be more masterful at identifying, expressing, and releasing feelings. Mm -hmm. For some people, it's about, this is not about you believing what I believe. This is about you really looking at what you believe. You know, I mean, there, there are some things that you, you, you may not realize you took on from your mother and father. You completely rebelled against your mother and father. You now are, would go to war and die for these beliefs. But um, I'm going to hold a mirror up for you. You know, can, can we have a come to Jesus conversation just for you to look at? This is not about you believing what I believe. This is about you really looking at you're holding those beliefs as the truth. They might have a piece of your discontent. They might have a way of blocking you from accessing your enormous capacity for healing. And lastly, um, given who I am, and it's one of the wonderful places you and I met long, long ago when you were a student. <laughs> Some people are lost because they have no spiritual compass. Some people are lost because they don't have a sense of their purpose. They're caught in making money or caught in helping their children or holding on to their marriage or something, taking care of their mother and father or never wanting to speak to their mother, father, who knows what. But whether they're churchgoers or not, that's religion. Spiritually, they're missing quite a dimension of the interconnectedness of it all. And, and so I'm not talking about past lives. I'm having enough challenges with this life. I don't know anything about past lives, just not my wheelhouse. Um, naturopathic medicine for me is, uh, okay, uh, I'm gonna look at your vitamins and eat more of this and eat less of that and build your body up and you do or don't have adrenal dysfunction. You do or don't have heavy metals, we need to detox. But let's also look at, we are a quadrinity. We're mental, emotional, spiritual beings. And it's interesting to look at the money, time, orientation, the over-identification to our, our, each of us about, it's all physical, you know, and, and, we're, and, and we wanna eat better and tell me what's right and should I eat that and should I go off that? It's like, well, how are you doing emotionally? Mm. You know, how much joy do you have? Um, so I'm extraordinarily blessed and it's, it's just a privilege to be able to speak to people knee to knee, one-on-one -on -one, with Zoom all over the world or have people do my courses um, where I can not have an agenda. I think this is in your head. Oh my God, I'd never say that to somebody. Or I think this is because you know, you're not really resolving your divorce, this person died. I don't say that. The, 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 and it's, it, it's one of the things that had me fall in love with you so easily is, you and I know it's about creating space for people to discover. 
you and I know that we don't need to define space for our clients. What we're doing is creating an environment where they can get curious um, and learn things from the inside out. And our job is to tickle them and provoke them and have them think in different ways. I'll stop. <laughs> brilliant, brilliant, brilliant response, Dr. Taylor. Love that. And there's so many things I want to just mention and comment on. What first thing that came to mind was when you said, you know, what if you could be more at home in your body? And I think I saw this on your Facebook page recently. It was a picture, I believe you posted it. If you don't take care of your body, where are you going to live? Yeah, that was, and it was like, yep. yeah, and just it's a, it's a beautiful reminder. And I hope that people see a, you know, your immense passion for what you do. But on top of that, that they notice we live in such a physically dominant world from the perspective of the quadrinity you talked about, you know, we're spiritual, mental, emotional, physical beings. And yet most of the time, at least from a healthcare perspective, we're really looking at just the physical side and we're kind of looking at it, uh, it, it with, separate from all the rest of it as if it's not interconnected. And if somebody comes, you know, anyone, someone is listening right now, you know, maybe you've got thyroid problems or maybe you've got an autoimmune disease or you've got whatever arthritis, you've got something going on, maybe. And yes, it might be purely physical. And if that's the case, we, you, know, you have all of the therapies for that, right? But there's also emotional components, there's mental components, there's a whole life that you've lived that's led you to this point. And so much of it that could be going on may not be being addressed. And so mm -hmm. I love that you dive into that. So yeah. thank you so much for doing the work that you do. Yeah. It, when, when somebody is seeing me individually, whether it's a Zoom consult or somebody comes to see me physically, um, I am looking for an opening to say to them, um, I'm going to stay open that a change in what you eat, a change in supplements, really understanding your strengths and weaknesses, how to strengthen your strengths, how to strengthen your weaknesses, what organs need to be built up, a vitamin here, a herb there. I'm going to stay open that that's going to make an enormously profound difference. I'm inviting you to stay open <laughs> that by changing those physical dynamics, it might only help 10, 15, 20, 30, 40%. And if that's true, then I'm going to ask you to be open to other possibilities that I might offer you to pray, think, meditate about. So it's not like it's got to be psycho spiritual. Yeah. Something that I know is near and dear to both of us you know, is transformation. Yeah. And I know that you've spent an immense amount of time over the years working with clients and patients and guiding them. And I'd love to know, what do you see as a difference between transformation and change? Mm. Well, first thing, uh, um, there are a, a, I've been blessed with some extraordinary teachers and mentors um, that I've, I've nudged my way to the front of the line to, to really be a real open student. So Werner Erhard, Tony Robbins, there, there are a number of different than some of my meditation teachers or other spiritual teachers. Um, that in the mid 70s, late 70s, as I was going through and finishing my, that's 1970s, uh, Dr. Jamil, that's not <laughs> 1870s. Oh. Um, um, so, so the word transformation is way more in the culture than it was in the 70s and 80s. I mean, I listen to TV ads, and, and why am I watching that? And, and listen to, and so people have kind of co-opted and in our culture, a lot of people are using transformation as if it's the same thing as change. You know, do, do, take this medicine and it's gonna transform you. Yikes, stripes. So my understanding very briefly, uh, and I did a whole conference on this. There, there's a free talk on my website on the role of transformation in healthcare. Um, briefly, transformation is not better than change. Transformation is a point of view. It's an orientation. Um, there's a French saying that's hung around for a while. Be good for one of us to get the derivation of this. The more things change, the more things stay the same. Um, and it doesn't mean that change is bad. Um, the world of transformation is when you're working with yourself, let alone somebody else, and what you're looking for are options and possibilities 
of a different way to hold something, look at something, perceive something, think about something, that you're not looking at something, your eczema, your headache, uh, the way you get angry too much, as a how to stop that, that's wrong, you know, I need to fix that. Change has some uh, association with whatever you're going to change to is probably better than what is. Change is usually based on a presupposition that whatever's going on is not as good as it could be. There is not that preposition with transformation. Transformation is about growth and possibilities. Um, so that there's a completely different word that I use that I ask people to step into. It's not about absolutely being positive about what this means, but th the word is called context. That when you're in a transformational paradigm and you're really looking for not the answer, but a number of possible answers because you're curious, then your context is what's the blessing in disguise here? What is it I could learn? as opposed to what I'm looking at uh, shouldn't be, and I need to X, you know, change less of it, more of it or something. Mm -hmm. So th 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 there's a whole weekend or more, you know, you, you, you and I spent the, the beginning of our relationship, you know, with four, th you know, three day weekends somewhat to really pick apart and give people experiences. So when I lead my Love Your Body program, I tell people, this is not about you being able to understand and intellectualize transformation. I, I wanna offer you a 21 day experience of what it's like to live your life in questions that are all about you accessing your capacity for healing, seeing what's blocking you, but not from a place of judging good, bad, right, wrong. Mm -hmm. Change often is associated with criticism and judgment, not saying that's bad. I'm saying transformation has something to do with equanimity. Transformation has something to do with compassion. Transformation has something to do with curiosity and, and um, purposefully exploring, being really open. And when you get to a place, it's, ah, that's interesting. Let me keep looking as opposed to, ah, that's the answer. Let's do that. Yeah, I love that. I think it was Nietzsche who said this, but there's, it, regardless, there's a quote. It's something to the extent of, this is my way. What is your way? As, to, as for the way, there is no the way. That'll work. And yep. so there's a few things that you said there that kind of sparked this question. What have you found to be the role or the roles that forgiveness and resistance play in the healing journey? I hesitate to answer you essential lest I have a position. Um, so I, I, I'm now challenging myself to, for most people, <clears throat> And this is recent in the last uh, three, four, five years. I, I think in my earlier days, uh, in, in the late 70s, early 80s, mid 80s, I saw resistance as something to overcome. And I, I think, mm, sorry, uh, I didn't think, I definitely judged, you're resisting. What are we gonna do to get you to stop resisting? <laughs> Now I see somebody's resistance as, hmm, they're not ready. I uh, wonder what I could do maybe to uh, make some jokes. I wonder what I could do to um, make it safe for them. Mm. I wonder what I could do to um, focus on a number of strengths rather than try to get them over their resistance. So, um, Resistance could be a way that somebody's protecting themselves uh, and maybe not. And resistance could be somebody is not able to say, I'm not there yet. I'm not ready. I'm not ready to do this work. And so a teacher said to me, 
they're not formulating. You shouldn't be formulating. They're in pre-formulation. <laughs> they need to be, you need to work with them to get them ready to do the work. They're not ready to do the work. Now, some of the work for some of us has to do with hurts, losses, betrayals, um, um, super disappointments, um, death, um, divorce. Um, life can be really unfair, um, maybe even sometimes cruel judgment. From another perspective, life's not cruel. Life just unfolds the way it unfolds. And um, both in the close to 20,000 people who've done the Love Your Body program, the third week in that three week process is about compassion and forgiveness. So I have a pretty good sample of people. Uh, and then there's what I've needed to go through in terms of losses, my dogs dying, um, uh, intimate relationships with women I love that's like, where did that dream go? Wow. Um, who was I being to not be able to continue and sustain that? Um, I've seen in my own life that forgiveness is something that's more costly to me. Uh, when I don't forgive, forgiveness is more costly to me. Uh, it's not about, well, I'm not done being angry with you. So, uh, you know, and by the way, you don't deserve to be forgiven anyway. Um, that all that kind of stuff is, is, is I'm still holding on to my hurt. I'm, I'm in pre-formulation. <laughs> I'm, I'm resisting. Um, and I've seen some miracles with people either in my Love Your Body programs, people I'm working one-on-one, -on -one, where they've given me permission, I've asked, and I'm holding the space that they don't have to be fully discharged of all their emotion and anger and resentment. Just by declaration, my intention is to release this. My intention is to really get senior who was I being that I attracted this into the world? So one of the things about transformation is responsibility. One of the things about transformation is, okay, I'm gonna work on giving up being a victim. Every time I see that I'm blaming somebody else, no matter how awful it is that something happened to me, I'm gonna look from the point of view of what am I supposed to learn here? So I've seen that forgiveness is one of those things like gratitude, like compassion, like trust. It's, it's for me a portal, it's a door for people to heal. Go back to where I first started when you asked me that beautiful question. I have to be cautious about you should forgive your mother. You should forgive your girlfriend for going off with this much more handsome guy than you. It wouldn't, that would not be true if it were you, of course. <laughs> but it could be true if it was me. <laughs> So lots, lots, lots for me to continue to learn. And I've um, had some wonderful guides and teachers about the actual process of guiding somebody to feel safe enough to be able to release the hurt, to release the anger, to re release the, well, if you're calling that betrayal, so what what are you associating with that and there's rage or there's you know just a whole raft of feelings that somebody's in the thicket of and all those thorns are hurting somebody and how to give that back to the universe through a process of forgiveness is way more than just saying okay i'll forgive you <laughs> if life were that easy I could be going play pickleball or golf or something else. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, there is, um, in my experience, I've seen just immense healing result from forgiveness and being willing to release the past, obviously retain the learnings, learn from it, but release the past because, you know, as I often tell my clients, the past let you let you go a long time ago. But when you hold on to it, you bring it back into the present in your experience and you re-experience it. 
Mm. And so earlier when we were talking about the four bodies, let's say the physical, mental, emotional, spiritual, and it, it speaks right to this, that so often, whether it be the autoimmune disease or the inflammatory condition or the whatever, it can have an emotional component and there can be suppressed anger, like you talked about, even a rage, if it's intense, there could be guilt, there could be all these kind of things that have been suppressed maybe for years or decades. And over time, what that does to the system can lead to physical manifestations of disease. And um, as you also mentioned, I have found that withholding forgiveness, even though we think we're maybe sticking it to the other person or hurting the other person, because we might tell us ourselves a story, they don't deserve it, something like that. Withholding forgiveness usually only hurts us because it's yeah. robbing us of our peace that we could be experiencing right now. And when we can forgive, we're forgiving, not in the sense that we're condone, we're condoning what happened, we're saying it's okay, we're saying it should have happened, none of that. We're just coming from that headspace of, you know, I refuse to remain in prison any longer in this self-created prison that I've been holding myself in. I'm going to let that go, learn from it, it doesn't happen again, but mm -hmm. move myself forward as a free person. It reminds me of that, uh, it's a quote by the Sufi poet uh, Rumi. Why do you remain in prison when the door is wide open? And it's just that idea. We're, it's like we're in this prison of our mind. And like the, in my head, I see it as like you have the little cup and you're moving it back and forth on the bars and you're basically trying to call for the dog or the guard to come with the key, but the key's in your pocket. And the door's not even locked. <laughs> and if you were to just open it and step out and realize, like you said, it's not always, it's not as easy as just, okay, I forgive. Yep. But there's a starting point of stepping into that role of responsibility of ownership of being that creator of our life and saying you know what do i want to continue to allow this story to run the show yeah. Yeah. so um beautifully said dr jamil and anybody who's listening to dr jamil and i um <clears throat> as we learn from one another and have this discussion um please don't listen to what we're saying as you should forgive. Mm -hmm. um, I, I know that you'll agree with me, Dr. Jamil. The, the question is, who might I be uh, if I did forgive? Yeah. Uh, the question might be, uh, could I forgive? In other words, <clears throat> you and I, Dr. Jamil, see our roles as constructing a relationship with a person or people if we're teaching lots at the same time of um, laying a path down for people of, well, how are we gonna do that? So a lot of times in this kind of conversation, somebody will go, I don't know how I could forgive that person. Well, I mean, look at what they did to me. Part of the story, look at what they did to me. Um, and, and that's not, if you're listening to this, you don't need to know how. This is just about the possibility of you getting senior to your normal mind and the way you are brought up. And is there a possibility that this is not about right or wrong? I mean, you deserve, it's okay to be this hurt. It's okay to be this angry. It's okay to be this deeply, deeply affected emotionally. And is it possible that you can see there's a lesson here rather than you being right about what happened who might you become if you found your way through with a lot of compassion for yourself a lot of compassion for this other person or people or event and you know what what's the possibility and just stay in the question so it's not like I, I, these guys are telling me I should forgive, you know, and my headaches will go away or my colitis might get better or I'll have way more energy or I'll be able to conceive and be fertile right now. It's choking my creativity. Who knows, yeah. you know? Yeah, it reminds me of a, so every day, you know, I have a self-creation practice of reinventing myself and I take my clients through this process as well. And one of my declarations is I am free from have to, supposed to, need to, must do, and should do. I choose to, or I don't. For me, I choose to create my life in such a way that have to, supposed to, need to, must do, and should do don't exist. I don't use those words. Mm -hmm. And in that same type of way, like you said, we're not saying you should forgive, but coming from that choose to, 
you could what could be possible for me and what could be possible for my life going forward and what could be possible for this relationship if i chose to forgive and then look into that and then let's say it feels pretty good well do you want that and if the answer is yes you could choose it you don't have to you're not supposed to none of that but if you did it might be beautiful it might be more beautiful yeah and so thank you so much for going down that little rabbit hole with me that was beautiful and I'd love to, you know, I see for those watching on video, Dr. Taylor has this beautiful book, Love Your Body to the left of him near, I think it's a, a Buddha statue, which is great. And I'd love for you to share with us, tell us about your book and what inspired you to write it. Mm. I think what inspired me to write it was the first 10,000 people who did the Love Your Body program, this 21 day detox, cleanse, not detox, where I brought in different the way people, not just what they eat, but their relationship to their food, not just that they have more energy, but how are they relating to their body? I would care, careful about saying the temple. I don't want it to get too significant, but the, the privilege of having a body and, and to do our spiritual, mental, emotional work tends to be easier if you're not really distracted with all sorts of things not working because you're a Bentley or a Rolls Royce and, you know, you're following a manual for a Kia. I don't know mm. what a bad man Kia is, but <laughs> so, um, so um, nine years, ten, 10 years ago, I wrote a book with my son and that was an extraordinary experience. Um, Luke, I hope this was as good for you as it was for me. Actually, dad, I don't think it was. Um, <laughs> he's a incredible light and a really amazing writer. Um, and then uh, over one, two, three, four, five years, like I, I have more that, how did I not put in a chapter about communication? How did I not put in a chapter about connection? How did I not put in a chapter about contribution? How did I not put in a chapter about community? Community is so important. So um, two and a half years ago, I wrote six new chapters. And uh, the first half of the book is on functional medicine, and there is um, short chapters that have little um, half-page case histories for me to talk about blood sugar stability and detoxing, and is your head on straight, and what's the difference between functional medicine and allopathic medicine. And the second half of the book are pillars, foundations of healing, trust, emotions, conditioned patterns, <clears throat> excuse me, and each of those chapters, also two to three pages, chunk, bite size, mm -hmm. have writing exercises or visualizations. And so um, I don't think I'm in strong competition with De Deepak or Andrew Weil in terms of numbers of books sold. Yet, yet. Um, and, and I've been really blessed that all of the proceeds of the book go to different nonprofits. So I don't earn any money from, so I like to, to use that as a way of giving back. And um, I'm, I'm fortunate whether people order it from Amazon or they come to my website to order it. Um, I don't know if I'll write another book, Dr. Jamil. I might not, but but I'm, I'm, I'm extremely, um, you know, sometimes I've said what I need to say this is, this is just right. You need me to say anything else? Actually not. <laughs> so I wrote a book on something that you and I know is dear to me, which are what are the distinctions between health as in function and healing? And in a bite-sized way, can this be a, an opener for people to work with great doctors like you or other nature paths where it, it, it kind of just simplifies some constructs some models? Mm. that's my book fantastic and so there, so the book let's say from the like the written perspective yeah and then there's an online perspective that i'm on my understanding it's an online health and healing program you offer you talked about it a little bit over twenty thousand people have gone through it which is amazing can you tell us about that well i had to pay them a lot of money for them to go through i don't want you to think <laughs> they paid me money i mean i was on the corner you know <laughs> So in 1981, I was a seminar, seminar leader in Werner's world. And the, the idea of community, the idea of a seminar, the, I, and, 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 I, and I was 
out of medical school a couple of years, naturopathic school, and, and I put together a community where people could do cleanses and detoxes. But because of who I am, it kind of morphed into, well, maybe you don't want to do a cleanse, but maybe your relationship with food is really adolescent. It's, it's pretty unconscious. You just eat for taste. Or by the way, you're not eating, eating anything. You know, you're racing through life, eating on the run, e eating in the car. I know you would never eat in the car, Dr. Jamil, but it's amazing. There are a lot of people who eat in the car. You know, it's dangerous. So I designed this program <clears throat> where it's based around agreements, where the first week is about being mindful. It's, it's being a better witness. Second week's about trust. Not sure about you, but for me, there are a lot of people who, now there are a lot of people who are not open to acupuncture. A lot of people are not open to herbs and homeopathy. A lot of people who think what you and I do is really like, nah. But there are a lot of people who are a little open or a lot open, wondering why they're kind of stuck in the results, you know, are only 10, 20, 30%. And one of the pieces that I've discovered is that people will trust you or me or someone outside of themselves more than themselves. Mm. So I give people a three week experience where one of the pieces is to start to remove the blocks and start to access their own capacity to, for healing. And one of the blocks is, given the way their body has responded and the way they've eaten and not eaten and exercised or not exercised, meditated, not the way their self-care has come down the pike. The truth is they really don't, they're, they're in hope. They, they really do not trust their own capacity for healing. And I've seen in doing my love your body program that things like forgiveness and compassion, that's the third week of this program. Trust is the second week and being able to witness as opposed to, I'm not saying the way you're thinking is wrong and the way you're believing is wrong. I'm saying there's value in developing a witness, an observer who's not judging good, bad, right, wrong, but just is present to what's so. And that's the dance of the Love Your Body program where people are journaling, I make jokes, we dance, we listen to music, um, uh, we exercise. And, and people make different agreements and start to shift the locus of their attention to uh, who I am as a being that can promise. Mm -hmm. You know, I have this spectacularly gorgeous dog next to me. She's so sweet. She's so feminine. She's so delightful. She's so playful. I don't think she can promise me anything, really. We human beings have the capacity to promise things to ourselves. We human beings have the ability to promise things to each other. And I offer people an orientation that has no truth value. Mm -hmm. And here it is. When you and I were born, we were born to love ourselves and others. We were not born to be more effective at complaining and being a victim about why the world treats us the way it does. And so the love your body is not about only re-establishing new habits it's about reclaiming that original promise of taking on a body it's been a real gift and a real privilege to guide people through the process yeah i, I can see that uh, i know firsthand but i can also see that like I, I love it i love it thank you so much for sharing that and for doing all the good that you do because it, it even you know, it's, it's funny too because it's not just love your body from a physical there's all the bodies, <laughs> like the physical, mental, emotional, spiritual. You're it's hitting all yeah. yeah. Now, for anyone who's listening right now who is maybe struggling, they've been in the mindset of, I've tried everything, nothing's working, they're feeling frustrated. What message do you have for them in their own capacity to heal? Uh, I would call you up as soon as uh, they get your number. And, and I, I'd, I'd, I'd urge them to either get your counsel uh, if, if they're interested in a tag team that, that is, is for a future event, they could call both of us, you know, and you could speak to them one week, I could speak to them the next week. The first thing I would say to them is thank you for the question. The first thing I would say is I hear in your question 
a persistence, an unwillingness to just settle for the answers you've gotten. Mm. And, and I would want them to take a breath with me so that they could really acknowledge themselves for what is it I want to learn here? What, what, what is it that my body is attempting to communicate? What is the blessing in disguise? And then um, I would make sure that they knew I heard them, that in their reality, assuming they said exactly what you said, I would say, I, I hear that from, it, it, it looks to you that you've tried everything. <clears throat> I won't take that personally because you haven't tried me. <laughs> And you haven't tried Dr. Jamil. He's a special kind of human being. And I'd really make sure that they felt seen about the urgency that they're feeling for God, the universe, their life, to give them some wisdom so that they could be more comfortable, they could be more settled they could have more contentment, they could have more satisfaction. Mm. Um, so I've had a lot, not dozens, not hundreds, but hundreds and hundreds of people who I would say, these are people who are really complicated. There are a lot of people, there are a lot of people closer than coming to see me by traveling to see me or by Zoom. Um, so I, the last thing I would say in a brief answer would be, <clears throat> There's what you've been doing, you know, you said you've done an awful lot of things, mm -hmm. you went to chiropractor and acupuncture, you've stood on your head, you've done yoga, you haven't done yoga, you chewed tobacco, you know, you've done race car driving, you've done a lot of things, whatever it is, you work with four different nature paths and 17 different functional medicine doctors. And I would say <clears throat> that the possibility is we need to look at something that some people refer to as mindset. We, we might need to step back before we would construct another strategy or another plan, do more of this, do less of that. We might need to look at some other dynamics that are winding up not giving you the results you want, but more importantly, I'm wondering if in the failures you're still feeling empowered, that's really difficult. Or if in all the things you're doing, you're constantly feeling disempowered. And then I would say to you, just in case we never speak again, I want you to know I'm curious about how it is that none of this has worked. Mm -hmm. I'm curious, is there some way unconsciously that you're not aware that you're blocking yourself? Yeah. Being careful that that's not an opportunity to make yourself wrong. Mm -hmm. I'd stop somewhere in there and say, what do you think? Yeah, for everyone listening, the, that, especially that last point Dr. Taylor just brought up, you know, another way of, my, at least my interpretation of describing that is this idea of secondary gain. And if we were to sit there and listen and say, okay, here's something that I've been trying to do for a long time. And it's, and Honey's saying hi to us now. So, so something's trying to, uh, Honey's his dog. <laughs> I'm not sure what I'm talking about. But um, here's something I've been trying to do for a long time. It doesn't seem to be working on a consistent basis. Is it possible that I might be sabotaging it unconsciously because there's a fear that I might lose something that matters to me that's important if I were to get this thing that I say that I want? And very often that ends up being an immense insight for somebody that changes the whole game. And once they figure out and identify what that is, if it's present, then the transformation, the healing, the whatever it is that they're trying to do falls into place and happens. Yeah. Yep. Yep, yep, yep. <laughs> and so on a, on a more personal note, you know, the foundation for everything that I do is helping people create an extraordinary life without regret. And I'd love to ask you to share, what does an extraordinary life without regret mean to you? What does an extraordinary, li extraordinary life without regret? I know, honey, what's going on?
He's like, I'll handle this one, Dad. <laughs> right. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. Um, I want to be, be careful of answering that question. Because I don't know for me, and you know, you and I have not discussed this, whether... I think life for me can be extraordinary, even if I have some regret. Mm. I, I, I want to be careful of giving myself permission to mourn, um, um, have feelings associated with loss. Mm -hmm. That doesn't mean I'm judging, I shouldn't have done that, or I should have done it better. I don't have to critique. Um, it, it just means something happened. I have some emotion called loss or regret, unless you're making a distinction between regret and loss. So regret maybe, I'm talking off the top of my head for you, um, includes some judgment that something shouldn't have been. So for me, when I think about that question, I think about it, what would be the life that at the end of life, you know, head hits the pillow metaphorically, and you can look back and regardless of what's happened, regardless mm -hmm. of the challenges and the hardships and all these things, what I did and didn't do, I can look back and say, wow, what a life. Yes. So, so it's okay to, uh, in that process, to have some loss and or regret. We're going to use those words somewhat uh, um, synonymously. Um, there's this edge of... Um, wanting to be better, want to contribute more, uh, wanting to give more, wanting to have more capacity to be more generous. Uh, there's this edge, this masculine part, if you'll allow me, of um, um, more is better that I'm mindful of. Does that rip me off from contentment mm -hmm. and a, a deep sense of satisfaction? So um, in giving me space to sort this out, thank you both for the question as well as for the space. Um, an extraordinary life for me would mean I would have more moments of acknowledging contentment and satisfaction regardless of whether something could be better. Like it's possible some, some, some things can always be better. Yeah. You know, and for the moment, did I give 100%? Was I pretty present? Was I doing the best I could? You know, including was I resisting? Uh, whatever. Um, so extraordinary for me means um, that my passion level is really high. Uh, my state of feeling inspired is really high. Um, my sense of... Um, connection is really profound. Um, extraordinary for me means um, in spirit, I'm inspired. Yeah. Um, extraordinary is not better than ordinary. It's just extra ordinary. Mm -hmm. And um, opens up for me huge realms of gratitude, which I've come to appreciate is a practice. Yeah. So the, the more I'm grateful for, the more I see ordinary things in extraordinary ways. Yeah, I love that. And something you said, it reminded me of a quote that I heard from Dr. Wayne Dyer, where he says, where is the peace and more is better? And right, and so this idea of, and this kind of brings it full circle in our conversation, there's nothing wrong with more. If you want more of this, more of that, where money, prestige, whatever, go for it. You can have anything you want, no judgment on that. And when we catch ourselves in that trap of when I get X, then I'll be peaceful, successful, happy, whatever the story is enough, it's a trap. And, and like, I love that you said, it's those moments of contentment, those moments of regardless of how much quote unquote better it could be, it's perfect right now. And like, this is wonderful. 
And so I really love that as well as what the last thing you said, you know, seeing the ordinary as extraordinary. I often tell people there's no such thing as ordinary. <laughs> it's like, it's all a miracle. Like it's, it, it, there it is. It's just that you only see it if you have eyes for it and you only have eyes for it if you're looking for it and whatever you look for, you find. And so if you're looking for the problems, that's what you see. If you're looking for what's lacking, yep. it's what you see. But if you're looking for, like you said, the lessons, the blessings, all that, it's yep. amazing how beautiful life gets. Now, something I wanted to get your opinion on. So there are people listening to this podcast in every age demographic. And I think that so much of our wisdom comes in reflection of the life we've lived. And like you said, in many areas of your life, you've, it, you would answer it a certain way years ago, but now you've learned so much more. You've experienced so much more. You've introspected so much more. You go, this is how I would handle it now. For those listening who are, let's say, 18 years old, let's imagine you were talking to 18-year-old Barry at the time. What message would you have for him? Her. That works too. <laughs> to be 18 and to allow somebody to be 18, which is different than, I'd like you to really answer this like you're 25 <laughs> or 30. 18 year olds don't ask me this question. <laughs> I'd need to listen something more than the age, I think to answer you, um, you know, who I was at 18, I think I was still suffering a lot when I was 18 of not playing enough when I was five, six, eight, 10, 12, 15 years old. Mm. And, and I wasn't even aware that I could learn to play because I was wallowing in not having played enough with me. Yeah. You know, whereas I've met some 18 year olds, I have some 18 year old patients. Um, both my boys have been 18. I wish I knew you were 18. You were, you were probably 35 when you were 18. I have a feeling, I have a feeling you, were, you were 40 when you were 18. <laughs> um, I, I need to listen to what their concerns are. You know, I, I mean, 40, 50, 60 year olds, I'm talking about aging gracefully. The idea of dying from old age versus dying of disease. An 18 year old, that's what you asked me. I'm not gonna talk to them about aging gracefully. If, if I can pause, to, I think I'll, I'll clarify it. So there's a quote, which well, I'll do my best to paraphrase, that says, um, was it youth is wasted on the young. Right. Something from the perspective that here you are, this individual who's gained so much wisdom in his yeah. life, and if you were speaking to somebody who was younger, who was maybe feeling a little bit lost, somebody okay. who was younger, having a lot of maybe judgments about themselves, gotcha. somebody who was going through their life. Okay, I can, yeah. I can answer this. I, that, that I can answer. Perfect. And I probably would not tell them youth is wasted on the young. <laughs> <laughs> but I agree. <laughs> I'll buy that one. Um, I would, I, I mean, it, it, depending on their receptivity, I might say something like, if I knew then what I know now, I would give myself a lot of permission to have a lot of different experiences. I would experiment and see life as a big buffet. And I wouldn't be concerned about getting married or having a steady girlfriend or, I mean, well, um, I, I, I would be, con I'd be, I might be more open to just taking joy in experimenting. I would take joy in learning uh, in a fun way, not necessarily learning to get leverage in society or to make more money. I would say, allow life to come to you. Allow life to unfold as opposed to, I need to find my life purpose. Mm. You're 18, you know, travel, don't travel. Learn a sport, don't learn a sport. Learn a language, don't learn a language. You know, go to different halls of venues of 
religious denominations. See if you can listen carefully to how some other people, particularly people who touch and inspire you, see how they dance, see how they sing, see, see, see what kind of food they eat. You know, I would, I would leave them with a, if I die tomorrow and I can't have this conversation, continue this conversation with you, this is like the last thing I'm going to say to you, I would say, revel in experimenting. Mm. Re really take joy in, before this is a good or bad experience, just collect a lot of experiences. And then allow yourself to see, ah, I'd like to do that again. Nah, meh, meh, you know. And you might make a mistake because the second or third time you did that might have been, well, wow, that's like, you know, going to the top of Mount Everest and you blew it off after the first one. It, it's close enough to jazz. I would say you're 18. Can you enjoy sunny days and rainy days? Mm. You know, can you enjoy early morning as much as you can enjoy late evening? Can you enjoy this person who's radically different in the way they, that you think and just respect their mind is really wired up differently than yours. Okay, we're back. Uh, had a Zoom crash for some reason, but- a Zoom glitch. Uh, yeah, but everyone had just heard Dr. Taylor just finished saying something so beautiful. And one thing I wanted to bring up is for anyone listening who might be thinking, well, that's all great, but I'm not 18. I want you to see that so much of what he said can apply to your life right now, regardless of age. If you're alive, you can, you can enjoy it when it's raining and when it's not raining. You can enjoy the, the late nights and the early mornings. You can do all these things that he said. So I would strongly encourage you to go back and listen to what he shared again, because it was truly phenomenal advice. And so Dr. Taylor, as we get ready to wrap up, what, is, what would you say is the biggest risk that you've taken that you're deeply grateful for and why? besides jumping out of an airplane with a parachute on my back. Um, <clears throat> what's the biggest risk that I took that I'm grateful for? Yeah. Where do you get these questions from? <laughs> Introspection. <laughs> You're looking at your belly button from the outside or the inside. What are you doing? Uh, what's the biggest risk I've taken that I'm grateful for? I think the biggest risk that I'm grateful for is to keep listening to what my life purpose is to serve other people. Um, I've had a number of failed um, relationships. Um, I thought my clinic of 16 years was gonna be a stepping stone for an inpatient facility. That was my dream. Um, I've had a number of losses that for my karma like when my dogs died kind of really really took my breath away really different than when my mother and father died and um i'm listening to your question as losses rather than failures um or well that didn't turn out the way i thought it was going to turn out <laughs> that did not sustain itself and <clears throat> through um, going back into um, a contemplative, meditative place, um, reaching out to one of my teachers who've helped cheer me on and have held a certain space for me. Um, I was able to work through the failure. This is not, this, do not put more energy time into making that work. Uh, the, the, this, this chapter's over you know, how to metabolize the lessons of what worked and what didn't work. And I, I think the, the risk of still staying true to um, partners, relationships, um, being um, 
madly in love with the privilege of being knee to knee with people and teaching people and learning from people as I do that. Um, words that come out of my mouth to some clients are, um, I really understand why you're never going to get another dog because it was so hurtful. I really understand why you're not going to get married or have another intimate relationship because the last one was so brutally painful when it ended. Um, and I think what's true for me is after I felt the depth of what was pretty damn uncomfortable, I reached back deeply down within myself and remembered what I'm here for. Mm. And um, that hasn't been anywhere near as easy as it might sound, mm -hmm. but it, it kind of resulted in at some point I would begin again as opposed to, well, I'm not supposed to get another dog. Well, I'll show you, honey, you know, or I'm not supposed to be in another intimate relationship or, okay, I'm not going to have another multidisciplinary health center with 15 full-time secretaries and 15 part-time secretaries and 175 doctors. Been there, done that, bought the t-shirt. But other things that haven't worked out and haven't sustained over decades, it's, okay, uh, I, I, I have learned a lot from that failure. Um, and I have recalibrated, and I'm not the same person in an intimate relationship, in a professional relationship. Um, and um, that was an interesting experiment that I thought was going to last a bit longer. Yeah. And, and um, I'm up for the next chapter. Yeah. For everyone listening, you know, there is challenges and hardships and things that you're dealing with right now. And something I think Dr. Taylor's story beautifully exemplifies. And please, again, listen to this, not from the perspective of you should do it, but as a possibility, what if you chose to play again? What if you chose to step back in? What could be possible? You know, so um, there's that expression, when one door closes, another one opens. You know, the, the, the end is just a, the beginning of a new beginning, you know, that kind of thing. And as painful as it might be, you know, there's that Winston Churchill quote, when you're going through hell, keep going. Because if you don't keep going and you just stay there, well, that's a choice and not personally what I would choose. And you get to decide for yourself, do I want to continue to be here? But if I kept moving through that darkness, through that pain, is it possible on the other side of that, there's love again, there's light, there's happy moments again. And I think that, I can't speak for everyone, but I think that most people who have made that decision are happy they did. And so, as again, as we wrap up, what are you excited about that you're currently working on? What am I excited about? Um, just started a Love Your Body program with a new group of people last night. Mm -hmm. um, and Love Your Body programs are always a forum for me to learn how to more effectively hold space and what I can learn. Um, I'm happy to say that my book is coming out as an audio book. Uh, I just got the files yesterday afternoon uh, so that people will be able to order it either on my website or on different places that people order audio books from. Um, and um, yeah, I'm doing a, a, a lot of learning these days about my own mindset um, that um, is related to how I can contribute more effectively to other people. More about that on another podcast, yeah. but I'm doing some really good learnings with some people. Fantastic. So for our listeners, our audience today, who've just loved this conversation, how can they learn about, learn more about your book, about your Love Your Body program, about you? Uh, send me an email, drbarry at drbarrytaylor.com, drbarry at drbarrytaylor.com uh, and I'll get you on my mailing list. Uh, you can noodle around. Uh, there's lots of radio and TV shows. You can read parts of my book on my website, drbarrytaylor.com. And um, send, send, me, send, send me a bill so I can send you some kind of gift because talking to you is always so great. You are such a gift. Thank you so much, Dr. Barry. Yeah. Dr. Yeah. Uh, I will have all of the links that you mentioned in the show notes so people can you know, access them easily. 
Yeah. For everyone listening, you know, if you enjoyed our conversation, I strongly encourage you, please leave a review. It really helps on Thank Apple you. or wherever you're listening from and subscribe so you get updated. There's new episodes get released. Dr. Taylor, is there anything else that you'd like to say before we close? I love you. And if you've listened to this uh, and other Dr. Jamil um, podcasts, send them to some friends that you want to contribute to. Ask them, hey, would you listen to a couple of minutes of this one or some of the other ones? Uh, because um, Dr. Jamil has a lot of light. In case you don't know, uh, I am the uh, president emeritus of the Dr. Jamil fan club. Um, <laughs> And, and I encourage you to, to join up. It's, it's free uh, and uh, you'll get a lot of value by watching him smile. And, and don't forget the free t-shirt, you know? <laughs> free t-shirt. <laughs> uh, thank you so much, Dr. Taylor. And um, as we close, you know, just as a reminder to people, you know, my life's work is to help leaders, champions, and high performers to create an extraordinary life without regret. If these conversations have served you, if you if this resonates and you'd like to have a conversation to see how else I can serve you, you can find me at jamilsayage.com and on social media at Dr. Jamil Sayage, DR and then my name on Instagram. And Facebook is just my name, Jamil Sayage, and I'll have the links as well as everything Dr. Taylor shared if you want to reach out to him in the show notes below. Dr. Taylor, thank you again so much for being with us, for everyone listening. Thank you for taking the time, your attention, your energy, your presence is the greatest gift you can give us. And we really appreciate that. I found that most people's favorite day to change their life is tomorrow, and that's why they stay stuck. But the thing is that you can be different. For you, transformation can start today. So I'd like you to reflect on our conversation today. What nuggets of gold, what nuggets of wisdom, what possibilities were generated for you that you start thinking about and saying, that's interesting. What if I did something about that? Ask yourself, you know, what would my future self thank me for? Get clear on that, go do that, and let's create the rest of your life as the best of your life. Have a beautiful rest of your day. Take care. God bless. Thank you for being with us today. If this conversation served you, it would mean a lot if you left a review and shared this with anyone who may benefit. An extraordinary life without regret is available to you now. Choose it. It's your time.